Doris, send in that kid with the cat comic strip. I'm right here, Mr. Dingbat. You draw the strip with the cat and the duck, right? Cuckoo cat, that's right, sir. It's terrible! In fact, it started out terrible and somehow it got worse. How is that possible? Never mind. When was the last time you had a funny idea? Today, sir. Look at the latest installment. Duke the duck gets his foot stuck in a web woven by Sticky the spider, and Cuckoo Cat says, well, one good web deserves another. See, because ducks have webbed feet. I've been to funerals that were funnier than that. Kid, it's 1931. People want new stuff in their funny papers. Here at Dingback Quality Features, we got the best strips. We got Dr. Cheese, Gooseberry Corners, Petroleum Pete, Little Nasty, Little Carla, Little Stinky, Little Honeybee, Little Muskrat, Little Jimmy, Little Does She Know. We got the adventures of Rebecca Lobo and Bobo the Hobo. We got the Sneeze Brothers. Why do we need you, kid? Because, Mr. Dingback, America's going through hard times. Americans need a good laugh and they need inspiration from a, a plucky cat with three good legs, one good eye, and one big heart. I thought it was the duck who had an eye. Patch. No, sir, it's Cuckoo Cat. Duke the Duck has a quacking cough. You know, like a like a hacking cough? I know what it's like to taste my lasagna lunch three hours later because your comic gives me heartburn, kid. I'm putting the cat to sleep. No, Mr. Dingbat, I'll do anything. Anything? Yes, sir. Okay, the cat has to wear pants. Add a smaller sidekick cat named Little Cuckoo, and in next week's strips, all the animals have to fight Bolshevik pirates. Our readers are very worried about Bolshevik pirates just now. I'll keep you going another 15 weeks. Thanks, Mr. Dingbat. You won't regret it. My wife said that as part of our wedding vows. She was wrong. You're wrong. I'm wrong. But what are you going to do? This is a lousy, stinking business. It's also the beating heart of America. Newspaper comic strips are what define our national spirit. Just listen to this show and find out. And now, the creator of Rex Ashburn, frontier proctologist, Colin McEnroe. That one also did not last very many weeks with its syndicate. So uh, we're going to be talking about comic strips today, and which is a favorite topic of mine. You will discover this as we go along. Um, I grew up loving comic strips, and then I worked in the newspaper business for 20 years, and I was one of the guys who loved the comic strips so much. So there's a few things that I have to tell you. First of all, um, in the second and third segments, you'll hear kind of different voices. You'll hear uh, from the, uh, the editor at one newspaper who uh, picked all the comic strips and dealt with all the complaints about comic strips and stuff like that. Like that. You'll also hear from a guy who still draws a comic strip. That'll be Bill Griffith, who uh, draws, of course, <clears throat> Zippy the Pinhead. And he actually does live in Connecticut. But we're going to begin with the story of what was called the Connecticut School, uh, a group of, uh, of cartoonists, a surprisingly a large and diverse group of cartoonists who, who lived in Connecticut during the 1950s and 60s and did their work there. Before I get into that, I have to tell you one other thing which is that today we're doing what we call Radio for the Deaf. We do it twice a month if possible. Uh, what we do is we offer the show uh, interpreted in American Sign Language by two wonderful interpreters who are sitting right here in the room uh, with me. Uh, so Sarah and Mary Sue are here interpreting. You can see that on the Colin McEnroe Show Facebook page. It's up there as a Facebook live video stream. It's being done live right now. You can look at it later too. So if you know somebody anywhere in America, anywhere in the world who might like to uh, hear, quote unquote, this show, you, they can hear it that way. They can see it actually in American Sign Language. I hope I explained that reasonably well. All right. Now it's time to talk to our premier guest here. Colin Murphy is editor at large of Vanity Fair um, and the author of uh, many books, including most recently, I'm holding it right in my hand, Cartoon County, My Father and His Friends in the Golden Age of Make-Believe. Uh, he's joining us right now to talk about that. Welcome to our show, sir. Thank you for having me on, Colin. Great to be with you. So um, you have a kind of double relationship to the world of comic strips. Uh, your father uh, drew two of the most famous and classic ones of their day, uh, and then you eventually became the writer uh, on one of the two. Maybe we'll get to that, that in a second. But one of the th first things you do for us is to paint this world that existed not too far from where I'm sitting right now in Fairfield County, uh, what you call the – what people, I guess, call the Connecticut School. Explain, explain what's meant by the Connecticut School when it's applied to cartoonists. Well, it was a, it was a term that was uh, invented by Dick Brown, who uh, drew High, High and Lois and created Hagar the Horrible, wonderful, wonderful man. And he, he created it in a slightly joshing uh, mood – to refer to the fact that, you know, when he looked around uh, in Fairfield County, there were, you know, maybe a hundred or so other cartoonists living there. And this includes um, 
you know, comic strip cartoonists, you know, the people who did um, Beetle Bailey and Little Orphan Annie and Barnaby and Quincy and um, Snuffy Smith, and uh, but also people who did gag cartoons for the New Yorker. So there was a there was a large um, uh, bunch of you know quasi bohemian uh, illustrators and cartoonists all in this one place, and they had they had gravitated there for a bunch of reasons, some of which no longer obtain. One of them was you had to be close to New York City because that's where all the work was. You know, the syndicates were mostly based there. The magazines that did cartoons were, were based there. You had to be able to get, get it in and out. Uh, and another thing was uh, if you were raising a family, you needed a place where it was you know, cheap. And back in those days, <laughs> not the case now by any means, but in the late 40s and 50s, Fairfield County was uh, a pretty good place to, to live. And, uh, and then Connecticut had no income tax back then. Mm-hmm. So if you were trying to figure out, well, am I going to live in Westchester or New Jersey or Connecticut, that was another big factor. And so once you had a few of these people moving out into Connecticut, then more began to move out. And by the time I was born and you know, was growing up in the 50s and 60s, there was a very large group there, and it was very close-knit and very sociable and uh, a wonderful group of people to grow up uh, among. You know, there's so many uh, interesting aspects to all this. And, and so um, some cartoonists, uh, particularly earlier in their careers, would work in what was called the bullpen. That was not located in Connecticut. That would be located in the offices of the syndicate. Uh, smoky, messy, not necessarily pleasant uh, environment where up-and-coming cartoonists might be working on other people's work. But the, the life that you lived, the life that you grew up in, was one uh, uh, where, in fact, it was almost taken for granted that one's father was going to be on the physical home property all day long, right? Well, that's that's right. And looking back, I realized that the the um, the characteristic that first made me understand that my father was different, and the fathers of other people I knew were were different, who were cartoonists, was the fact that they were home all day. And you came home from school, and the first thing you did was you went out to the studio which in our case was just a separate building behind the, behind the house. And I had seven brothers and sisters, and this was a big um, magnet for us because studios were a wonderful place. Every cartoonist had a great studio. It was, you know, the smells were wonderful. It was, you know, paint and ink and uh, wood shavings. There were costumes around that you could dress up in if you wanted to, you know, helmets and funny hats and... Uh, feather boas, all kinds of stuff, and 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 your dad was there, and he you know generally had time for you. So the the the, the sheer physical proximity was a was a wonderful aspect of childhood, but also just the mindset of these people. Uh, um, you know, in later life, I know plenty of people who are you know, bankers and in advertising and many other professions, and they're and they're wonderful people. But cartoonists were laid back in a very particular way, and they were funny in a particular way, and they had a certain sense of freedom, and uh, you know, living living one's life the way you want to live it, that was a little bit unusual, and uh, and and I think that attitude really um, you know, affected the way you know us kids in the family you know grew up and and decided to live our lives. Right. There are just great stories in the book. I mean, some of these, uh, I think of Mort Walker, uh, probably most famous for Beetle Bailey, as maybe this kind of anarchical kind of person. But there's a stories about him going grocery shopping, right? That uh, I think you mentioned in the book that when people buy originals, when collectors get originals of some of the cartoon strips from this era, they, they often find a little uh, grocery shopping list there, right? <laughs> yes. Well, well, you know, I have strips of my dad's, you know, I have very clear memories. There was an intercom between our house and the studio. And my mother was really, she was managing things. She was a crack organizer. You had to be if you had eight kids. And we had this big Victorian house and that was at the front of the property and the studio was in the back. And the last thing she wanted to do was to have to run out to the studio every time something came up. So we had an intercom set up. And I'd be sitting out in the studio because I like to be with my dad. I like to draw, and, and 
uh, just sort of sit sit with him, uh, and she would buzz, and and she would say, you know, when you walk into town, like into Costco, which is the town where we lived, um, I need you to get, and then he would write things on the edge of the strip, you know, diapers, Chesterfields, you know, <laughs> bottle of scotch. I, 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 but I, I have strips with with these notations on them, and I'm sure that other cartoonists, you know, did the did the exact same thing. Um, yeah, there are just great stories there. And, and you said, you know, the cartoonists have a very specific uh, sense of humor. I love the story about uh, Mort Walker losing track of his wife in, in, in a grocery store or supermarket and, and going to the courtesy desk and saying, in what wa- aisle are wives? wives. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I, well, I remember Dick Brown, who, uh, you know, Dick was a, was a uh, Ursine character, and he was a little bit sloppy, his his shirt would be hanging out, and um, uh, children loved him because he looked like uh, the kind of, you know, if, if you looked at him and you thought, that's an adult, uh, it just gave you a different sense of the possibilities of, of adulthood than, than <laughs> the typical one. And I remember once he was over at my parents' house for a cocktail party, and as usual, all the kids in our family were were given jobs to do, and my younger brother, Finn, was passing around trays of, of cheese and crackers. He was probably like five. And he came to Dick Brown, and Dick Brown, with his big hands, just took a huge uh, handful of crackers and put them in his jacket pocket. And my brother, Finn, just looked at him wondering, you know, what are you doing? And Dick, seeing the look in his eye, said to him, Poverty could be just around the corner. <laughs> um, we're talking to Colin Murphy right now. Uh, he has very up close and personal uh, experiences with the golden age of uh, of newspaper uh, cartooning, comic strips in the 1950s and, and 1960s. Uh, there's so many things that I want to um, ask you about, but uh, I, I think one thing uh, that's kind of that fascinates me too is so. Uh, censorship uh, happened in certain ways, and maybe a good way to talk about this is that Big Ben Bolt, uh, one of your father's strips, he was a boxer. Boxers boxed with their shirts off, uh, but Big Ben Bolt had no nipples. Why would that be? <laughs> yes, well, he was not a freak of nature. Right. Um, and leaving aside the question of why why men have nipples in the first place, which, which gets us off into different terrain, but the, the syndicates all had rules about things that you could and couldn't show. And, you know, some of the rules make perfect sense. You and I would come up with the exact same rules. But some of the rules uh, seem to make no sense at all. For instance, you weren't allowed to show a pair of dirty socks lying on a chair. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know why that was the case. I can't even think of a reason. Showing male nipples was also forbidden. And there are plenty of strips that, you know, require men to appear bare-chested. You know, there's, you know, there's Alley Oop, there's BC, and then there's, you know, Joe Palooka and Big Ben Bolt, the strip my father did. And I was just look, I, I pulled a, a couple strips out of Big Ben Bolt the other day, uh, and was just looking at them. It was there were some, you know, some dramatic fight scenes. And there are no nipples. Mm-hmm. Um, you can put some chest hair on. That's fine. Uh, and I still don't know, you know, why that was the case. The other thing you couldn't show was navels. Right. And this was a um, this was a running battle that <clears throat> Mort Walker had with the syndicate, which I think he enjoyed immensely. That there was a character named Miss Buxley, and she sometimes wore a bikini. And so, you know, he would draw a navel and. The syndicate would say, "No, no, no! You can't have a navel," and they would use an exacto knife and take the navel off. And when enough of them got collected, they would send them back to Mort. And you know, this drove him crazy. And so he began gratuitously putting navels in. You know, he would put a crate of navel oranges in the picture for no reason at all, just to be able to put navels in. Right. And, yeah, that's right. So he had uh, uh, extra navels, navel oranges uh, uh, in this in the strip. And you know, Miss Buxley is kind of interesting. She's an example of also a way in which 
cartoon, the world of cartoons didn't necessarily have to keep pace with the world outside, right? I mean, in a way, Miss Buxley was is very typical of a kind of character who began to bother feminists at a certain point. She's highly sexualized. I loved the suppressed Mort Walker st- script where, where some man in a bar says, I want to go where no man has gone before, and Miss Buckley says, too late. Um, but, I mean, there's a way in which the world of cartoons was what it was, right? You, Mort... Uh, Mort Walker didn't necessarily have to have read the feminine mystique. Uh, no, and although he, you know, he he was a widely read man. I mean, he's still alive, mm-hmm. and um, I saw him not long ago. And um, just as a quick aside, the, the idea for for Trixie, the character in High and Lois, who um, we don't, we, we know what she is thinking because she. Uh, her thoughts are displayed in thought balloons, but she never speaks. The idea for that came from reading Sinclair Lewis and encountering interior dialogue. But you're you're right about uh, the the complicated relationship between what strips can do and say and show and the larger culture. And when you're dealing with a mass medium like a newspaper, uh, that comes very much into play because the um, the, the standards that you're dealing with are not necessarily cutting-edge standards. Now, to be fair about Miss Buxley, uh, Mort would always say that, you know, well, all right, yes, she is a you know, very attractive woman. But the real point of the jokes about her or in which she's involved is to make fun of and to skewer the other people in the strip, like General Half-Track. Mm-hmm. Yes, and... Yeah. General Halftrack was notably lecherous, and he obviously is, in many respects, the the, the butt of these jokes. That's hey, right. Colin, before we run out of time, we've got to talk about this remarkable thing, which I, I certainly had not known. Uh, Prince Valiant ran in the Hartford Current uh, when I was growing up. It never it looked so different from so many other strips. It seemed like a world unto itself. Um, how did it come to pass that you wound up joining your father on the creative staff uh, of Prince Valiant? The the strip is a glorious piece of work. It was created by uh, a master illustrator named Hal Foster, and it first appeared in 1937. And, and it all, almost always appeared on a full newspaper page, unlike you know, other pages of comics, which might have three or four different comics on a page. This took up the entire page. And it was illustrated in the, you know, in the, in the grand style of a you know, Howard Pyle and uh, so Hal did it for, you know, thirty some years, and uh, and then you know he was getting older. He was in his seventies and decided he wanted to give up the drawing, and he had known my father, and so eventually my father took it over and did it for thirty five years. Uh, and then there came a point where Hal had uh, decided that he wanted to give up the writing as well, and uh, you know I at that point was at the beginning of my own career as a as a writer and editor. I loved working with my father. So I began sending ideas to Hal for stories, and I began sending him uh, scripts. And uh, eventually, uh, it just it just kind of clicked. Uh, it made sense for, for my dad and myself to do it together. But uh, I'm will always be grateful to Hal for his tutelage because doing a strip is not straightforward. You know, for a reader, it's easy to get what's happening in the comic strip, whether it's funny or, or dramatic. But it's actually very hard to get that one-two punch of words, words and pictures. And it took me a while to get the hang of it, and, uh, and Hal was... was um, it was really extraordinary in the kind of advice that he offered in teaching me how to do it. There's, uh, I mean, we should say that, as you point out, uh, Prince Valiant was published only on Sundays, but there were more lines and more ink in a single panel than in a month of Peanuts. Um, what, was the, what, what did the pressure feel like? I mean, I've, I've known a bunch of cartoonists. Gary Trudeau is my freshman counselor in college. They all seem like they're under a tremendous amount of pressure all the time. Uh, it's, I think, why he and Bill Waterston and people like that have taken hiatuses. You know, if you're a reader and you're looking at at the at the funny pages, uh, probably in the back of your mind you're thinking, "What a great job!" You know, <laughs> can there be anything better? 
But if you um, if you look at it from the cartoonist point of view, uh, there are deadlines, and, and these deadlines are relentless. You know, a, a daily cartoon, by definition, is daily, and that means coming up with ideas uh, every single day, and that's hard. And uh, even something like Prince Valiant, which is was only once a week, the amount of work that went into it and the amount of research that went into it was extraordinary. It really it took a long time to uh, to create that strip. So cartoonists were always conscious of a deadline. And in the early days, you know, back before there were fax machines or the or the internet, uh, if you were late, it meant that you actually had to get on the train and bring your original work down to the syndicate in New York uh, to get it there on time. I'd, I had to do this once. I remember when I was around 10 years old. Um, my father was running so far behind. He had to get the strips into the, into the city. He couldn't spare the time just to take the train and hop into Manhattan. So he gave me the strips. <laughs> he put me on the train. He, he tied the strips up in brown paper, and then he... He tied them to me with a string to my belt, uh, and then he had people from the from the syndicate waiting at Grand Central Station as I got off the train to, to take the package from me and put me back on the train to Connecticut. So uh, we're going to have to stop with that lovely memory. This is a, a book, really, you spent a lot of time with this book. It is lavishly illustrated, both with comics and Polaroids and stuff like that. Uh, if you love this stuff, the way I love this stuff anyway, you've got to check out Cartoon County uh, by Cullen Murphy. We're going to take a break right now. We're going to come back with some different kinds of comic strip stories. So when we started doing the show, or even just talking about doing this show, uh, Jonathan McNichols, the producer, and I said, well, you have to get Henry McNulty. And I explained that Henry McNulty was a writer and editor, worked for the Hartford Current for more than 173 years <clears throat> or thereabouts, who was sort of my mentor when I got there. And Henry was always in charge of the comics. No matter what Henry's real job was, um, he was always in charge of the comics. And he was the person who was trusted to deal with all this. Uh, and because I was very interested in comics, in, in, in comic strips, and Henry and I would often sit around having these very Socratic conversations about what was going on in various comic strips. So it just seemed insane uh, to try to do this show without bringing Henry back in. So, well, first of all, welcome to WNPR, Henry McNulty. Mm, thank you, Colin. Good to be here. The first question is, are comics really for kids? That's the idea, right? The funny papers. You sit down, you're a kid, and you read the funny papers, or your dad reads you the funny papers. Well, I don't think that they are for kids mm -hmm. only. Uh, kids certainly read them. But it, it, let me just give you the Hartford Current as an example. Okay. There are 35 daily strips in the Hartford Current right mm. today. Yeah. Of those 35, in 22 percent of them, mm -hmm. the originators of the strips are dead. Right. In 8 percent of them, they're out and out reprints of what's been printed before, years, sometimes years ago, sometimes mm -hmm. decades ago. And uh, a lot of the strips are just plain old. Gil Thorpe, for example, 60 years old. <laughs> Judge Parker, 66 years old. Beetle Bailey and Peanuts, each 68 years old. Rex Morgan, 70. Mary Worth, 84. And Blondie, 88 years old. Right. And whenever there are comments made about uh, the, the comics, if there's a problem with the comics or something, it is always adults mm -hmm. that make these comments and not kids. So kids can enjoy comics, but I tell you, if you take a look at the average newspapers, comic lineup, it's not for kids. Oh, I have to talk about these problems with adults. First of all, vis-a-vis -vis Gil Thorpe, I don't know if you remember this, but so one of our other colleagues was a guy named John Sandberg, who had been a very distinguished athlete in his high school years at Windsor High School. And I don't know if he did this with you, but John Sandberg, who was a reporter of The Current, would come up to me on a regular basis and discuss how he thought Milford High, is that, is, what is it? It's Milford, yes. Milford High was going to do this year. And he would say, well, they've got Jack Sharkey back from last year so that they've got a power hit hitter. And they, you know, and he would describe all of this and, and some of the dynamics the way that you would talk about like UConn basketball. Or yeah, something. real people. Real right, people. Right, right. And I would look at him and I would go, it sort of does depend on how the person drawing the strip. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really not dependent on their talent pool at all. But for John, this was sort of, you know, I mean, he was having – he was an adult person right. having a specific kind of relationship. And that's typical of a lot of comic readers. Here's the other one that I want to bring up because I think you got a lot of these calls. I only got one of them. So there was this one. 
<laughs> there was this woman who used to call up the car, and we called her the breathing lady. And yeah, she would call the up, breathing lady. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and she would have this kind of gasping delivery. And so, and she would be transferred to you if you were sitting unsuspectingly at your desk, you know, trying to do something else. She called up the desk one night, and I think Dan Shea transferred her over to me because he was feeling mischievous. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, all, all comics have their uh, specific iconography and their visual tropes. When Andy Cap and his wife used to fight, they would a they would fight physically, and and they there would be this sort of spinning thing in the air from which. At certain points, like almost on, on the dial of a clock, you could see a fist sticking out or a foot or something like that. And so she was she said, I just don't understand why these two peoples are, are staying married. I mean, it's there's nothing wrong with getting divorced. And sometimes but like what do you say to somebody like that? Well, you can't say anything to that person. But <laughs> Andy Cap is an interesting case because that was cleaned up. Right. At the beginning of Andy Cap, which is a British import. Mm. He smoked right. and drank to excess. Mm-hmm. The strip is still going now, and he does neither. Mm. Nor does he fight with his wife, whose name is Flo, by the way. <laughs> so, I mean, did you get calls like that from oh, people yes. who just like, didn't like something that was happening? Oh, absolutely. Strip? I mean, the number one uh, call generator for me was Gary Larson's The Far Side. Right. And um, of all the calls that I got about The Far Side, there's one that he writes about in his book, The Prehistory of the Far Side, which Mm -hmm. came out a few years ago. And it is a cartoon that shows a woman inside her house, and she has barricaded the pet door, which is labeled Fifi. Mm -hmm. And Fifi, you can see out the window, is running toward the pet door. (laughs) And the caption says, here, Fifi, come on, faster, Fifi. And you know that Fifi is going to bash her brains out against the door. Right. So anyway... Uh, the calls just came flooding in and the letters and everything. All the letters that I got, I copied and sent off to Gary Larson, some of which he reprinted in his book, <laughs> uh, Prehistory of the Far Side. Here's one. Gary Larson's cartoon made me furious. It was cruel, stupid, and ridiculous, not to mention hideous, idiotic, and sick. In fact, all of Larson's cartoons make me furious. Reader, Connecticut. There, But that was far from the only complaint I got about mm. about stuff that was inappropriate for kids. That was the idea. Right. It will corrupt the kids. And it always seemed to me that, especially when it came to adult themes in comics, either kids would get it or they wouldn't get it. Right. And if they got it, they were old enough to get it. And if they didn't get it, who cares? Right. So I want to go through some of what I know to be some of your pet peeves. Um, <laughs> and, and me? Pet peeves? Yes, your pet peeves. <laughs> so one of them was that at a certain point, and it was usually when the originator of the strip was still drawing the strip, but was basically out of gas, that the strip would simply recycle the same tropes over and over again. Yes. So, for example, one of them that used to bother you was that there were these peanut strips that involved Sally wanting Linus to be her sweet baboo mm-hmm. and him saying, I'm not your sweet baboo. And there was really nothing new was really ever added to that formula, yet it was repeated for us, you know. Yeah. Scores of times, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, You know, Colin, on your show years ago, I got into trouble (laughs) talking about peanuts. Really? Yes, because unknown to me, Charles Schultz was ill, was was fatally ill. Mm -hmm. And so I had mentioned that, and I did a current piece too, that uh, the strip had run out of gas and was about, and and, and, how can you say this about a dying man? Well, I didn't know he was dying. I just knew he stopped the strip, you know? Okay, here's another thing that used to bother both of us. Um, and I will give you an example of a strip, and I hope the person who draw who, who drew it is not dying right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, but what too. are the odds? So Jeff McNelly, I think his name was McNelly. McNelly had been a very yes. successful editorial cartoonist, yes. single panel editorial cartoon. Yes. He launches a strip, strip called Shoe. Yes. And Shoe is about a bunch of birds. They're all birds, and they hang around in a bar. Um, right. And... The problem – well, you want to say what the problem is? Well, to begin with, I should tell you, Jeff McNelly died years ago. <laughs> so you're in trouble right away. <laughs> no, it's, it's it wouldn't make any difference to me. And it's one of the strips that has outlived its creator. Oh, really? So the other people drawing shoe? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, for, for years, for a decade, okay. more than a decade. I, I, 
Well, should we say what's wrong with it? You want me, do you want me to be one? Go. Be, okay. Well, the, what was wrong with it? But I happen to know that Henry agrees with me. About Let this. it be on you. Yes. Okay. Was that there was there weren't multiple perspectives? That a comic strip ultimately is an ensemble piece, and so you want somebody who's lyrical, you want somebody who's cynical, uh, you want somebody who's sad, you want somebody who's happy. You probably want a Charlie Brown, a David Copperfield, this kind of neutral, you know, character like the like the character of Alex and the on the series Taxi, right? You know, the Judge mm-hmm. character. You want somebody who's kind of a moral center to it. And on Shu, it was just a bunch of really pissed off birds who had the same dark, cynical take about everything. And there wasn't like there were any other kinds of birds. They right. were just the same bunch of birds who thought everything was crap. Well, it's interesting. I don't know if you're aware of this website called the Comics Curmudgeon. <laughs> Not. I think it's. I think it's. Uh, I can't it's, believe that neither you nor I is that person. But it's anyway, it's go ahead. Uh, by a guy named Josh. It's Josh Reads. J O S H R E A D S dot com. Mm-hmm. The comics curmudgeon, and every day they look at comics. And one of the things he points out is how often in Shu, the characters in the strip talk about like eating chicken. And he goes, wait a minute, these are birds. <laughs> is this a strip about cannibalism or what? Right. And but he points out little inconsistencies and humorous things. It's really worth, if you're interested in the comics, it's a Mm. great website. I think one of the things that you and I bonded on over early in our friendship was the fact that we both think that Pogo might be the greatest comic strip ever and possibly even one of the greatest contributions to Western civilization imaginable. Yes, I'm with you on that. I mean, it, it was brilliantly drawn and deeply textual. I mean, like so many things were going on there in terms of the use of language mm-hmm. and jokes that were being made and jokes about jokes being made. And it was postmodern that they would occasionally acknowledge they were in a comic strip or they would light their cigars by striking the match on the corner, mm-hmm. on the edge of the frame of the comic strip. And it was sort of the opposite of what we're talking about, too. I mean, nothing prepared you for the next day of Pogo. Right. Let me circle around to Pogo okay. by going through John Cullen Murphy. OK, that's good. Yes. Uh, John Cullen Murphy is known for was known for doing two strips, Prince Valiant, mm-hmm. which I I'm not really sure I would I would call a comic strip. It was no. it was uh, more a graphic novel. It was beautifully done, beautifully drawn, right. beautifully written, very nice, still going. Um, and the other is a strip that ran from 1950 to 1978 called Big Ben Bolt, um, Big which we we did not run that in the current. And it not, as far as I know, it did not run in the Hartford Times either. So it was sort of unknown in the Hartford area. Right. We certainly didn't run it in the current. Ben Bolt was a Harvard-educated prize fighter. Yeah. I know, right? Right. But anyway. Had a dog named Fifi. And he, he kept – he would get into all these adventures. It was partly about boxing. But for a time, he got injured and couldn't box anymore. So he became a journalist. And then he got involved fighting crime and all this. Well, by 1978 – This is my life. The, talking about my life. The strip had sort of run its course, and people weren't as interested in boxing anymore, so they decided to end it. Mm-hmm. So what they did was, in the last part of the last strip, Big Ben Bolt wins the Nobel Peace Prize. And the, the last strip, if you wanted it to be, and they offered newspapers the choice, would be Ben Bolt accepting the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. Strip ends, hero ends. But that was not the only ending. Mm-hmm. They offered for newspapers that wanted it, and some took it and some didn't, an unexpected ending, which was that he was involved with all these underworld characters trying to, trying to unmask them. And as he is giving his acceptance speech at the Nobel, at the Nobel Committee, he is assassinated. Wow. He is shot dead. And that's the end of the strip and the end of the story. Like nobody's ever done that. Well, I think that's the first time you've really sort of gotten rid of a character at like that, I, I can't it think of it. would be great if Shoe ended that way. <laughs> but, um, but giving— All the birds got shot. Giving alternate endings and giving alternate scenarios yeah. is not unknown. And now we move to Pogo. When Walt Kelly, by the, who, who, by the way, was a Connecticut person— right, Bridgeport. Well, yeah, lived in Bridgeport a long time, and then when he, he was an adult, lived in um, Darien for mm-hmm. a while. But anyway, when he got very political and newspapers began to say, I'm not sure we want to run this one, he would provide— other strips, which I think he called bunny rabbit strips. They were just, they were non-controversial. They were, they were funny, Mm -hmm. but they had nothing to do with politics. Yeah. So that sort of got him off the hook and he was able to keep the newspapers, you know, to keep his, his strip in the newspapers without them saying, I think we want to get rid of you. Right. I also recall that you you spent a certain amount of time just looking at 
other strips that were being submitted. The syndicates basically would say, okay, well, we got this new thing. Oh, yeah. Lee Salem or somebody would call you up from, from Universal Press and say, take a look at this. How, how did you decide? Did you just know right away whether something was good? Well, the problem is even if you knew it was good, there's no room for it. Right, because, you have to kill something. Right, you'd have to kill you have to something. to kill Miss Peach. Right, and to kill something, it was, well, when Mike Davies <laughs> was the, came to the current. He actually did kill Miss Peach. Literally, <laughs> to, he killed Miss Peach. To be the editor-in-chief. <laughs> Uh, after he'd been there a little while, like a month or so, he had, I don't know if you remember this, he had a discussion with the staff. One of the questions that they asked him, one of the first questions, what have you learned in your years as an editor in Kansas City? Number one thing he said was, don't mess with the comics. Right. He didn't use the word mess. He used a rather more vulgar word. But that was the point. Don't mess with the comics. And to get a new comic in, you can either expand the space in your newspaper and have more comics, which is expensive, mm -hmm. or you can shrink the size of the comics you have, which is crazy, mm -hmm. or you can get rid of one. Mm -hmm. And all of those are so problematic that it is very, very difficult for a new cartoonist to get his or her work in the paper. And that's why papers like The Current have comic strips that are 60, 88, 70 <laughs> years old. They just can't get rid of them. But didn't we, I think we did take either Miss Peach or Mama. They're both by Mel Lazarus, yes. right? Okay. Didn't we like move one of them into the classified ads? Or so? There was like one thing where we were trying to create some space and we moved one of them away from the other comics and like floated it over in like in the classified. Yeah, I don't something. think it was Miss Peach. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, there were People some got really mad about that too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Henry McNulty, first of all, if I feel like we're just sit sitting around the Hartford Current newsroom in 1976 talking about comic strips, which is in fact what we did do. But it is great to have you back here uh, here at WNPR. Anyway, thanks for joining me. Well, you're quite welcome, Colin. It's been fun to be here. So we're going to keep talking about comics for the whole show. When we come back from this break, Bill Griffith, the creator of Zippy the Pinhead, is going to join us for some recollections about his strip and other people's strips, including Prince Valiant. Today's show is produced by High and Lois's next door neighbor, Punchy McPants, and me, Kyone Wolf. Amanda Fish lives in apartment 3G, and the part of Bill Curry was played by Hagar the Horrible. Kevin McDermott played Mr. Dingbat in the intro, and we give special thanks to our whole radio for the deaf crew. And now, back to Colin. Bill Griffith is the creator and author of the daily comic strip Zippy and so much more besides. I mean, all kinds of books, including a graphic novel that's going to be coming out in 2019, uh, which is what? The Life and Times of Schlitzy the uh, Pinhead. Well, that's the subtitle, right? I've already screwed this thing yeah. up. Yeah, the title is Nobody's Fool, yeah. and the subtitle is uh, The Life and Times of Schlitzy the Pinhead. He was, He's known to people, if he's known at all, he's known as the pinhead that you see in several scenes in the movie Freaks, the 1932 Todd Browning movie. Right. So uh, we can't wait for that, and that'll be coming out in 2019, early 2019, but there's plenty of other stuff for us to consume. So, you know, you and I have talked so many times, and I was trying to think whether or not, because one of the things that happens in Zippy is that cartoon characters from other comic strips occasionally appear. They make cameos. I feel like I've seen Prince Valiant stride through a zippy frame, but maybe I'm making that up or hallucinating that. You did, but it goes way back. Yeah. Um, probably to 80s. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Know, the, yeah. those, those decades blur. But well, we go back to the 80s, so that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. It, I did a series of strips where you go into a dressing room uh, at King Features, which is the you know the syndicate that syndicates Zippy and you know dozens of other comics, yeah. and you go into the dressing room and there are all the cartoon characters getting into their makeup. <laughs> so Popeye is putting on his Popeye mask and his funny arms, and um, Prince Valiant is putting on his hair, and yeah. um, <laughs> Zippy just talks to them. I, I can't remember. <laughs> that's as much as I can remember about that one. Well, it makes me feel good that anyway I didn't hallucinate that whole thing that I actually did <laughs> no, see you it. Didn't. Well, we should talk a little bit about, uh, we, you know, before we started this conversation officially, we were talking about Connecticut cartoonists. We would start talking about Ernie Bushmiller, who famously drew Nancy. I have my own things, thoughts about Nancy, but I want to hear <laughs> what yours are. Well, I actually just got a copy, so I haven't read it yet, but there's a, a book that was published called How to Read Nancy. <laughs> um, and it's actually that all book. about, it's all about one comic strip. Yeah. It's an entire book about, <laughs> deconstructing one Nancy strip. Right. 
Mark Newgarden <laughs> is the kind of guy behind it who is a cartoonist himself and has been a, a Nancy devotee for decades. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, Nancy to me is is the definition of what comics are. Ernie Bushmiller was the Zen master of comics. He took comics and distilled it to its essence. At the same time, he didn't leave out humor. He didn't leave out playfulness. He didn't leave out a nice surreal edge. Mm -hmm. He would use slapstick very often. His stuff was very visual. You could almost look at the strip without reading the balloons and get what happened. I remember I did a little talk once at the... Connecticut National Cartoonist Society. A couple of years ago, they asked me to come and give a talk. <clears throat> and after the talk, I just was hanging out with the different people. And, and one of them was Ernie Bushmiller's neighbor growing up. <laughs> this was a man in his 60s who had known uh, Bushmiller when he was a teenager. He, the mm -hmm. neighbor. And so I said, gee, um, I've always wanted to know if you could answer this question. Was Ernie Bushmiller a primitive genius or was he sophisticated. And the guy, without blinking, said, oh, very sophisticated. Mm. I said, you mean he knew that the, there was a cult around him of Nancy aficionados who took it in a kind of zen-like way? And he said, oh, yeah, he knew about that. He liked that. He yeah. thought that was very nice. He thought that was a compliment. <laughs> it was kind of, uh, I was kind of so sorry to hear it. I thought I would prefer the, the primitive <laughs> genius. <laughs> um, it was outsider art. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But I think the truth is somewhere in between. He was both almost like a folk artist, and he was also a very sophisticated cartoonist. Right. I wanted the, joke, the story to go in a different direction. I feel as though the key to Nancy is the rocks. The rocks are the key to Nancy. The three rocks, yes. Yeah, those well, rocks are. That was my... The, if you if you look through Zippy, I can, if you go to the Zippy website and put in the words Three Rocks, <laughs> okay. you will come across dozens of strips in which the Three Rocks are featured. And I feel like the, maybe, the, I thought you were going to tell me the neighbor said, those are my rocks. Those are my well, rocks. I can tell you, I, here's, here's another Bushmiller story that addre addresses the Three Rocks directly. Okay. Sometime in the, Bushmiller died, I believe, in 79. Sometime in the 80s, there was a PBS documentary on cartoonists interviewing half a dozen daily strip cartoonists. And there's Ernie. And he was interviewed on his front lawn, sitting in a lawn chair. He had the world's neatest lawn. The lawn was perfectly uh, mown. There were hedges that were rounded, you know, that, that had been sculpted. The house looked, it looked like a panel from Nancy. And sure enough, over to the right, there they were, three rocks. Yeah. Not perfectly hemispherical, the way he draws them, but yeah. there they were, right. three rocks. Uh, the interviewer asked him at one point where he gets his ideas. This must have been planned in advance. So Ernie reaches off camera and pulls over a Sears robot catalog. Mm -hmm. He randomly pages through it and puts his thumb on a spot with his eyes closed. And then he looks at the interviewer and says, there's my strip for today. <laughs> <laughs> how, much, how much more zen can you get than that? <laughs> um, all right. Well, we're talking about Connecticut cartoonists with Bill Griffith, who is at times a Connecticut cartoonist. So the other person I have to ask you about is Mort Walker. But I feel like I have to establish something here, which is that I think sometime in the 80s, when you still lived in San Francisco, I was visiting you and you had just run into Mort Walker at a cartoonist convention, and you told me a story that was very funny. And then the next time I asked you to tell the story on the air, you told a completely different story about meeting Mort Walker. I did? Yeah. So now I just feel like maybe you're going to tell me a third story. But you tell any... <laughs> well, I think I know what you mean, but I don't remember there being two stories. In 1990, it was. I yeah, believe. that's when it was. Okay. The, the National Cartoonist Society met in San Francisco. This is not something I usually go to. I've been to two of them <laughs> 40 years. Um, and in 1990, it was still the old guard. Right. Gary Trudeau was refusing to come. Bill Keane gave a filthy speech <laughs> laced with curse words. Um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was like uh, the Raccoon Lodge from the Honeymooners. And so I, uh, you know, I'm appreciating it. It was fun. It was great. I liked it. I go into the bathroom, and there's Mort Walker, drunk as a skunk. This is before he got sober, and he challenges me to a pissing contest right. <laughs> with his junk hanging out. Right. <laughs> and 
He said, watch, uh, he, watch me hit that wall. Was that exactly. Good? And, you know, to decline was easy because he didn't remember what he said two seconds later. So <laughs> I just, I said, yeah, it's a nice day. I washed my hands and, and left. <laughs> but see, that, yeah, that was my, that was my first encounter with Mort Walker. But see, the, okay, the, uh, just so you, for your own personal records, the other story, the first story that you told me, and you would just come from this encounter, yeah. was that okay. you often used high and lowest. Oh, uh, right, often right. speaking from a cloud or something like that to Zippy um, yeah. in your strip. And, and, and so you were standing next to Wart, Wart uh, making your, your water, and you were sort of a little uncomfortable because you didn't know how Mort felt about this. It came up somehow, and Mort said, oh, yeah, I, I've seen that. Send me one of the originals. And yeah. you said yes, and then he said, and I'll, I'll send an original back. He did, we did. We traded originals. Yeah. But the, what he said was, what kind of, which, one, which one do you want? Which puts you in a very difficult position to summon up a specific high and lowest strip <laughs> that you would want. And you finally sort of kind of blurted out you wanted one that showed the configuration of Trixie's hair. Trixie's the little baby. And, oh, right. and Mort said, oh, you want one of the sunbeam strips. Right. Now, yeah. I don't know whether this is before or after you guys had the pissing. Actually, happened. you know what he did? He drew me a, a, a Trixie sunbeam drawing in color. Yeah. That's he didn't beautiful. send me a strip. He did a drawing just for me. Well, that's great. And I've got it to this day, and it's really cool. Although my weirdest and best encounter with the old guard that Mort represents was with Bill Keen, the cartoonist of the family circus, when um, I had Zippy enter a family circus reality where you know he follows the dotted lines around yeah. the backyards of, right. of suburbia and i'm two or three strips into it and i think gee i wonder if i if i called bill Keane, would he actually just jam with me on this on this series rather than me making the whole thing up and he would actually draw you know billy and jeffy and the mother and father and write their balloons and we would do it together so i called him and to my shock, he was totally into Zippy. He said he reads it every day in the in the Phoenix newspaper, <laughs> and he would be happy to do it. But I would have to write it all. He said. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, but he did do all the drawings. Yeah. And then, about two or three months later, I get a call from him. He says, "Now it's my turn to ask you to enter a family circus panel." And so, in sometime in the mid '90s, there's a panel of. I don't know, Jeffy, I guess, in bed. His mother is saying goodnight to him, and she, he's he's having a dream about, about Zippy. She says something like, what are you dreaming about, Jeffy? And he's dreaming about Zippy the Pinhead, <laughs> which I drew the thought balloon over his head. So that was uh, tit for tat. That well, actually is one of the high points of my career, I, <laughs> to, I would, to be in the family circuit. Yeah, no, I, I bow down to you now. <laughs> At some distance. He is in some way, he was when he was alive anyway. And yeah. he, even to the degree that his son keeps doing the strip, he is sort of a semi-inheritor of, of the Nancy tradition. Right. And, and so, I mean, we're, I don't want to take up too much more of your time here, but I mean, it seems as though, well, first, one thing that, that needs to be said here is that, you know, er, the stories that you're telling right now are stories of A, Zippy's somewhat postmodern take uh, on a bunch of bunch of latent uh, comic strips that are you know that have a sort of cornball appeal to them. But there's also, I mean, you couldn't do this. You can't. It's hard to impersonate something that you don't love. You know, you've got to you've got to like Bob Hope enough to be able to do a Bob Hope yeah, impersonation. To be a good satirist, you have to love your target, yeah, or at least feel some sort of affection, if not love. Right. If you didn't know what was appealing about Family Circus, you couldn't do anything. With it. Yes, I mean to me, Jerry Lewis is a monster, and I'm fascinated by him both. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love the guy, right? And so, I mean, in a way, I, I think it is fair to say that you you do kind of love the whole breadth of this story of car comic strips that have run in newspapers, cartoon strips that have run in newspapers for decades and decades and decades that, and decades. That's how I learned to read <laughs> when I was five years old or younger in Brooklyn. My, I, I don't re quite remember this, but my mother and father have told me that's. I would pick up the Sunday comics and try to read them, and I they would they would encourage me and congratulate me if I was able to read a two-syllable or three-syllable word, and um, that's where it started. Yeah. 
Well, Bill Griffith, it's always great to visit with you. I hope to visit with you sooner than a year from now when Nobody's Fool comes out. But it's been great to talk to you now. Likewise. I'm Zippy. Who are you? I'm Zippy. I'm Zippy. Who are you?